folks. Welcome to the philosophical exploration for this evening. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, a theme we've been talking about over the past few uh, explorations we've had. And that is the uh, concept of love and how uh, what we're trying to figure out what exactly love is in the, the, the philosophical equation of um, philosophy as the love of wisdom. Love is one part of that equation. So we're trying to dig deep and understand the meanings of love and to see if we can get to a definition of love, which maybe most accurately reflects the meaning of love in the definition of philosophy as the love of wisdom. And hopefully with uh, getting a clear insight into what love is, we'll have a clear concept of what philosophy is and what exactly we're doing on these uh, weekly or semi-weekly conversations that we're having here. And um, to maybe gain a better appreciation of philosophy and the value of philosophy and the value of open-ended exploratory conversations like the one we're about to have. So I digress. I'd like to bring it back to the main thread that we were going to talk about, which is love. And um, just to refresh the, the listeners, where we left off in this discussion of what love is, um, what, where it was um, with Empedocles, and Empedocles' definition of love, Empedocles, of course, being a Greek pre-Socratic philosopher, we've kind of been charting a historical um, uh, trajectory as we've been trying to figure out what exactly love is beginning with the ancient Greek pre-Socratic philosophers, Empedocles being the last in that uh, line of philosophers. And Empedocles has this concept of love as being this cosmic force, which is in this dual opposition with um, strife or hatred. And these are not so much the uh, emotions that we typically um, think of when we think of love and hatred or, or love and strife. These were more or less cosmic forces that operated on a grander scale. And love was sort of this force of attraction and hatred or strife was this force of repulsion. So all of, all of nature could basically be accounted for in terms of these dual forces interacting with other, each other, kind of like yin and yang in some sense, kind of kind of like a cosmic yin and yang, except uh, conceptualized somewhat differently. I kind of like to think of it as sort of this, this vortex pattern with love and hate kind of, you know, kind of rotating, kind of like a, a double helix or something. But in any case, uh, I, I digress. I, I'd like to bring back the, the thread to uh, this conversation we were going to have about um, love in Plato. Plato, of course, being the next in line in our historical tour of uh, philosophers. And I like to talk about the symposium because it's a, a work that's relevant to understanding the meaning of love in the philosophical canon. And Plato, of course, has, has his own take on the nature of love um, that he discusses through his mouthpiece, Socrates. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about what Socrates has to say about love. But maybe before I dive into that, I'll just offer a bit of context for the listeners um, regarding the symposium. So the symposium is perhaps one of Plato's poetic and dramatic masterpieces. It's a dialogue between, uh, it's basically a symposium is a dialogue. Um, and it's, it's essentially it's a former, formal drinking party that is held in honor of uh, the uh, poet playwright Agathon, who's basically put on his first successful production at the Linnea. And to gratify the wishes of uh, Phaedrus, who's a passionate admirer of speeches and rhetoric, and the namesake of one of Plato's dialogues, um, Phaedrus basically laments the lack of praise of the Greek poets and the writers um, have, have given to love. So on that basis, all the members of the, of the party, they agree to give speeches uh, in turn, uh, 
and uh, while they drink and while they praise love. So that's kind of a bit of the context. And within within this dialogue, um, the um, they're talking about a specific concept of love, which um, the Greeks refer to as eros. And eros is the the, the concept of love we've been examining. Um, that's what we examined in our in our past uh, conversation we had. And basically, eros means uh, sexual attraction and gratification between men and women uh, and teenage boys. But the primary goal of uh, the latter uh, relationship was not primarily sexual, but um, it sometimes was, but but it was in the main uh, a relationship between ethical and uh, and educa- uh, intellectual educator, the man and the adolescent. So it was kind of a um, an educational relationship, um, not exclusively a um, you know a sexual one. So so that's that's what the uh, the characters in this uh, dialogue are talking about when they're talking about their love. They're talking about love in that sense. But of course, it's not strictly in that sense. Plato also adds to it and adds in some of his own um, metaphysical ideas about what Eros is as well that we'll get into. But in any case, um, prior to Socrates, Socrates' speech uh, on love, there are several other speakers who speak before him in the symposium. And um, to begin with, um, there is um, Phaedrus. Phaedrus gives a speech on love. And then after him, uh, Posenius gives a speech. And then afterwards, I believe it is uh, Eurix Gamecus. Eurix, okay, you're going to have to tell me if I'm pronounce, pronouncing this right. Eurix Gamecus speech. I've been able to pronounce it before. I don't know why I can't right now, but um, in any case, that guy's speech. And then uh, Aristophanes' speech. And then after Aristophanes, Socrates uh, follows with his speech. And so, so basically, we're just going to jump forward into the actual uh, symposium because I think Soc- Socrates' speech, pr- I think, provides the best conceptual way, conceptualization of love insofar as it accurately represents Plato's views on, on love. So basically, we begin the speech and um, Socrates recounts his uh, encounter with Diotima, who was this wise woman in Mantinea in Greece. And she basically taught Socrates the, uh, about the art of love. So Socrates recounts her speech and basically all of his views on love are basically um, the same as uh, Diotimus in some sense. He's kind of a, um, what would you say, um, emulating her version of love. So Diotimus' argument as stated to Socrates is that love is neither beautiful nor good. So this is sort of the first approximation of what love is. And Socrates asks Diotima, what do you mean by that? And um, basically she suggests the nature of love is analogous to the nature of wisdom. It's it's basically uh, a mean between the extremes. And so you can draw an analogy between love and wisdom in this regard. So wisdom is, so say we say wisdom, you know, say, say it's true, Say if we define wisdom as true and prudent, prudent uh, judgment. Well, wisdom in that sense is a mean uh, or an intermediary between understanding and ignorance. So sim- similarly, love is an intermediary between goodness and beauty or ugliness and badness. And Diadema further adds, um, love is neither mortal or immortal. So it's all, you know, an in- intermediary between those two things as well. So not, so not only that, um, love is uh, also conceptualized as this great spirit and everything spiritual is a mean between a God and a mortal. So, so maybe just before 
diving more deeply into that, maybe we could just recount where we are, Ryan. Um, how are you sitting with all of this so far? Uh, good, yeah. I mean, I think this is right about where we left off. Uh, I remember talking about um, the intermediary between uh, mortal and immortal. I think we're kind of right around where, where we left off. Okay, good, good. It's all starting to come back to me, so. <laughs> nice. Nice. Well, yeah, I mean, this is nothing surprising to me so far. I mean, you know, this is just archetypal Greek thinking, you know, in terms of means and moderation and balance. So to continue, um, what are the functions of the great spirit? What, what is their nature? So let's, let's, let's probe that question. So the, basically these great spirits are godly messengers and they relay messages to mortal men. And they convey prayer and sacrifice, uh, sacrifice from men to gods. And they bring command uh, from the gods and gifts in return for sacrifices. So since these great spirits are intermediaries between gods and men, they round out the whole meaning. And uh, I'm sorry, they, they round out the whole, and I wasn't sure what that term meant in the context of that sentence. So let me just rephrase this. So since the great spirits are intermediaries between gods and men, they round out the whole and they bind everything with everything. Okay, that makes sense. They are also uh, the conduits of divination. They are the conduits through which art of the priests in uh, sac sacrifice and ritual, in enchantment and prophecy and sorcery passes. The gods do not interact directly with men. They interact uh, with, with men in mingling and conversing through the medium of spirits. Okay, so... They, they operate indirectly through the, these spirits. Whether, so whether men are awake or sleeping, they can affect them in those states. So a man who's wise in the ways of divination is a man of the spirit. He who is wise in various other ways in a profession or manual work is merely a mechanic. Okay. So, I don't know about, about you, but it, seems almost like like some proto-christian thought kind of like seeping in here uh in what diatoma is saying how so uh well just taking a look at it like talking about like spirit and like equating that with love like how they kind of sit on the same part of the spectrum you know there's um you know the spirits would sit between uh, the mortal and the immortal, so between us and God. And then there's uh, love, right, which is situated on the same part of that spectrum, right, between, uh, you know, good and bad or ugly or whatever. So, like, it just seems like yeah. it's it's sort of, like, predating the, the Christian idea of, like, Christ being the spirit. And, right you know, being like the embodiment of love, if, you know. <laughs> yeah, possibly, possibly. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me because I think in many ways, uh, the ancient Greeks influenced the Christian tradition in many significant ways. I'm not a scholar, a historical scholar myself of uh, the, the histories of religion and even the philosophies of religion, but it does seem like that could be implicit in this uh, discussion of spirit. And um, definitely seems to have divine nature to it in Plato and, um, or, or a, a semi-divine nature. You know, it's not quite, love maybe is not quite the emotion or, or um, thing that the gods necessarily have, but humans do do have it. Um, maybe it's what makes us distinctively human in a sense, but in any case, no, I think you bring up a good point. I'd like to maybe probe that a bit deep, more deeply. I don't have any definitive answers to that myself, um, but, but it does seem to make sense. 
So um, basically Socrates asks the question to Diotima, who are the father and mother of love? So basically Diotima tells him that it's Poros, who is the son of uh, Metis. And um, basically he was the father and um, Pania was love's mother. And so they, they, give, they gave birth to uh, love. So the procreation story goes like this. Um, Poros gets drunk on nectar at a feast commemorating uh, the new birth of Aphrodite. And feeling drowsy, he enters into the garden of Zeus and he falls asleep. So while sleeping, Penea schemes up a plan to uh, relieve her lack of resources by having a child with Poros. So she, set, so she lays beside him and becomes pregnant with love. So from um, so basically love was born um, love was born uh, in kind of the, the uh, idea was that love was born like the rationale I guess the rationale for why love was born was to follow Aphrodite and serve her because he was conceived on the day of her birth so that was kind of an interesting uh, synchronicity there and um, then Love uh, is also a lover of beauty because Aphrodite is especially beautiful. So love in this sense uh, has this, um, uh, is somewhat synonymous with Eros, or, or sorry, with Aphrodite. Um, there's an association there, which kind of makes sense because Aphrodite is the Greek god of beauty. So she's kind of the personification of one of the objects of love, I guess, because we love what is beautiful, and Aphrodite is beautiful. So that's the story of how it all got started, Ryan. That's how uh, love came into existence. All right, so love's lot in life. So the the dialogue between um, uh, the discussion between Socrates and Diotima continues, and basically Socrates is asking Diotima what. What kind of existence does um, love uh, lead? Um, and again, here we're talking in kind of personal terms. We're kind of talking about love as if love's this person who has an existence and lives a life like a person does. So basically, Diodos says love's lifestyle um, is similar to his parents. So in that sense, love is always poor. Um, love is neither delicate nor beautiful, contrary to pop popular opinion. Um, the female nature inherited from his mother uh, disposes love to be tough and shriveled, shoeless, homeless, and always in need. The masculine nature inherited from uh, love's father disposes love to be a schemer after the beautiful and the good. Also brave, impetuous, and intense, an awesome hunter, resourceful in the pursuit of intelligence, a lover of wisdom, and a genius. So it seems like love is quite the mix of contradictory qualities. You know, he's in one, in one sense, he's poor. Um, he's neither delicate nor beautiful, maybe somewhere in between. Um, he's got a female and a male nature. His female nature basically inclines love to, um, you know, be tough, um, but also to be kind of shriveled and, um, Weak in that respect, shoeless, homeless, um, and uh, always in need. So, 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 always seeking satiation in some sense. Um, you know, I guess we say in our ordinary language, you know, someone hungers with love. You know, so love is maybe needy in that sense. Um, and then love has, has this masculine nature that makes him a uh, schemer after the beautiful and the good. So he. He has a natural natural um, attraction to, to um, beautiful things, and um, and uh, he's also you know he also has qualities like being an awesome hunter and being highly intelligent and, and being uh, a genius. Like I mean, um, you know, he kind of sounds like a uh, um, as complex as a human being, you know. Um, as, yeah, yeah, basically complex as a human being. But um, 
in any case that's love that's love for you love is something that's complex i guess maybe that's what we should take away from that um now as to love's nature love is neither immortal nor mortal um loves becomes alive when his needs are gratified love perishes when his needs are thwarted so since he is the uh, he is his, he is his father's son um he's perpet he's perpetually reborn and even when he continually is brought back to life he's neither completely without resources nor abundantly rich okay now another uh, from from this point in the dialogue the dialogue kind of shifts to this discussion about um, love as being this intermediary between wisdom and ignorance. Um, so basically, um, love is a mean between wisdom and ignorance. And those who already possess wisdom, which is the gods, they don't love wisdom for you only love wisdom um, if you don't have it. So presumably, um, you know, the gods have, um, well, let's see. Maybe the gods are not in need of it, but the humans long for it because they don't have it. Um, so basically, those who do not possess wisdom are, are the ignorant, and they are content in their ignorance. You know, so that old saying, ignorance is bliss. And then Diodos says to Socrates at this point, if you don't think you need anything, of course, you won't want uh, what you uh, don't think you have. Or, so Sorry, no, she says, if you don't think you need anything, of course, you won't want what you don't think you have. I have uh, the, the quote here. Uh, if you don't think you need anything, of course, you won't want uh, what you don't think you need. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was just pondering yeah. the meaning of that. That's a. Uh... Yeah. Huh. I guess it's just I think it kind of is saying if if you don't have the thought of mind of the thing you want, you're not going to want it so it's the idea of the thing you want actually makes you want to have it in some sense this sounds like the start of a riddle <laughs> <laughs> you know that was a little bit, eh? Yeah. But no, I kind of think when I think of that, I kind of think um, how the mind uh, affects our perception. You know, our, our thoughts, our cognitions, our interpretations of things, our evaluations of things all impact our emotional responses, right? That, that's true. That's, you know, if mental causation exists, I think it exists in that manner that I described. But in any case, that's just an interesting quote from the symposium itself. Um, I don't know if it has any large bearing on this question of what love is exactly, other than that. I mean, we might long for love if we believe we need love. So from there, the discussion shifts into this um, conversation about those who love wisdom and those who love wisdom, again, they fall between the extremes of wise, the wise and the ignorant. And those who are wise uh, love what's beautiful, for wisdom and beauty are identical, and love is uh, one among them. And um, it's interesting, those who are wise love what is beautiful, for wisdom and beauty are identical. Is one among them. We have another riddle. <laughs> another riddle, yeah. For those who are wise, love. Uh, for those who are wise, love what's beautiful. For wisdom and beauty are identical, and love is one among them. Love is one among what?
So wisdom and beauty are identical. Okay, so wisdom and beauty are identical. So if you're wise, you're beautiful. If you're beautiful, you're wise. And, and those who... Okay, so... Okay, this is interesting. Okay, so those who love... Those who are wise... Uh, those who are wise love what is beautiful, okay? And what is beautiful for wisdom and beauty are identical, okay? So, okay, okay. So if you long for beauty, you're, you're longing for wisdom. And if you're longing for wisdom, you're longing for beauty. Okay, I don't know what this love is uh, one among them though thing is there. Um, I don't know if that's a typo on my part. In any case, let me continue, I digress. So love by necessity is a lover of wisdom and thus is characterized as, be as between wisdom and ignorance. Love's nature originates from his parentage, from a wise father and an ignorant mother. Okay, so again, we're seeing love emerging from these opposites. Okay, so from here, the discussion kind of gets into what I call the pragmatics of love. And what is the use of love to human beings? That's the question that's asked at this stage of the symposium. And we might break this pragmatic question down into sub-questions. We might ask, what is the chief desire of the lover of beautiful things? We might ask the other question, what is the chief desire of the lover of good things? So we might answer with as follows. So. In response to the question, what is the chief desire of the lover of beautiful things? We might say that he attains beautiful things. And to the question, what is the chief desire of the lover of good things? We might say that he attains good things. So there are the lover of beauty and the lover of the good. They're both striving after beautiful and good things, respectively. That's what motivates them. So then we might ask the next question, what does this attainment consist in? And Diodemus' answer to this is happiness. So those who uh, pursue what is beautiful, those who pursue what is good, fundamentally, they pursue these things for the sake of attaining happiness, it would seem. Eudaimonia, um, flourishing, living and doing well self-actualization that's what they're striving after that's uh, that's that's part of the the greek ethical you know conception of the universe everything has a telos or, or a purpose and that telos or purpose is to seek out eudaimonia in some sense i think okay so that's why we pursue beauty that's why we pursue the good because we're seeking happiness now, questions, um, these are questions that Di Diodema poses to Socrates, which is, why are some people in love whereas other people are not in love? So this question is basically, what differentiates those who are in love and those who are not in love? So it would seem that uh, certain people have a, an affinity for a special kind of love. And this special kind of love is love in a holistic sense. Whereas love in the ordinary sense means something else. And the different kinds of love are basically analogous to the different kinds of poetry. So um, what is the nature of this kind of holistic love? Um, the desire for good things or for happiness? Um, I guess basically that's what the, the nature of the love is. It's a desire for good things or for happiness. Okay. So, and then, then they kind of briefly talk about different words, words that are predicated of this holistic love. So love or in love or lovers. And then they shift the uh, conversation to talking about um, So they, they, at, that, at this stage of the, the dialogue, they're talking about love in a kind of a holistic sense, being different types and kinds of love. Um, they're analogous to different 
types of poetry. Okay. So then the question to ask um, Socrates is, do people want to uh, want the good to be theirs forever? And Socrates says, yes. Then Diodemus says, therefore, love is wanting to possess the good forever. In other words, the object of love is wanting to possess the good forever. Okay. Makes sense to me. I mean, um, you know, be, to be perpetually, um, I mean, good would be a good thing, I would think. Um, okay, so the next uh, question of Socrates is, how do lovers pursue love? So Socrates says, I don't know. What do you think, Diadema? And Diadema says, it's giving birth to beauty, whether in body or in soul. Okay. That's what lovers are after. They want to give birth to beauty. Okay, so this leads into an interesting discussion about the reproduction in the body and soul. So he's talking about how, how individuals uh, how individuals pursue love through, through this reproductive process. And Diadema basically says pregnancy, reproduction, this is an immortal thing for all mortal animals to do. And it cannot occur in anything that is uh, out of harmony. But ugliness is one of, uh, basically uh, ugliness is out of harmony with all, uh, all that is godly. Beauty, however, is harmony with the divine. And then Socrates says, what causes this desire to reproduce? How does it relate to love? And then Diadema says, everything naturally values its own offspring because it is for the sake of immortality that everything shows zeal, which is love. And because what is departing and aging leaves behind something new, something such as it has been, had been, okay. That's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, it, uh, you know, reproduction, uh, you know, if you, we go back just a little bit there, you know, it talks about giving birth to beauty, uh, whether in the body or in the soul. Um, and I was kind of thinking about that, like, in terms of, you know, you know, as, as even there, they go on to say, like, in terms of children and, you know, are perhaps, uh, doomed quest to seek some sort of immortality through like our legacy whether that's you know something that we create like a, a business or or something um or maybe it's just like through our through our children um you know we're always kind of trying to create these these beautiful things i guess you know in the sort of broad sense uh you know and it is sort of like a quest for immortality, you know, it's as it's, it's close as that we can get uh, to immortality, perhaps. Yeah, it would seem so. I think it seems like a natural um, motivation to, um, to pursue love. Um, love is reproduction and reproduction in some sense is is the through which you um, leave your legacy then then it would seem to be worth striving for you know uh, I guess I guess it's one way that hu human beings are try to overcome their mortal limitations yeah. you know, to to reproduce physically I suppose um, to have have a, a biological legacy which is your children if you have children um and in a genetic legacy like even just thinking about it on a more micro level um, we kind of achieve immortality i guess in some sense through our genes um, it it seems to me too that the this idea of love is sort of the the driving force uh that pushes us towards uh, the gods or um, towards uh, as Plato would probably uh, say like towards 
like striving towards the forms, you know what I mean? Like so, something like that. It seems to be the, the, the primary motivating factor or uh, life force, whatever you want to call it, that uh, that's moving us towards uh, being godlike in whatever sense, you know. And I, I guess the Greeks would call that, you know, the closest that we can get to being with the gods or being like a god is achieving happiness, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, actualizing our potential kind of, you know, within every human being as a little um, oak of a man, you know, that evolves from this little acorn, you know, this seed potential of an acorn um, and into this, this godly man, you know, there's this godly man existing within every, within every, you know, young boy or something, right? And, yeah. Uh, a little, a little Hercules to be, um, but um, I do think that ma- this makes lots of sense. It seems like love, or uh, we're being drawn toward this ideal, and and maybe this ideal, in some sense, is a knowledge of love, like a knowledge of beauty. Well, we'll get a little bit more into this. I mean. Um, It'll get clear, I guess, as we proceed, how exactly Plato's conceptualizing love. But right now he's talking more or less about how those, like the activities that characterize those people who pursue love. So those activities essentially are these reproductive activities. So in, so let me just, again, switch back to this, this topic. Um, those who embody love by reproduction in the soul. Okay, so this is the next topic in the the symposium here. So basically someone who embodies love appears apparently irrational to the onlooker until they realize that they are motivated by love. Okay, that's interesting. He who, okay, so so that's interesting because I guess love can maybe make you look eccentric or unusual or maybe even crazy. Like if someone saw you behaving a certain way and, and um, it just, it didn't make sense on the face of it. But then when you told them, you know, it's because you were motivated by love, then it all makes kind of sense. Like maybe that person's distressed over a loved one or something like that. Um, you know, they just found out their loved one is, um, you know, just got hit by a car is in, in the hospital or something and they're they're doing okay but there's you know maybe they're they've sustained some major injuries or something and you're feeling distressed after, over that and you know had someone would look at you and you would look sad and distressed and and that behavior might seem someone inexplicable but then you say oh well my loved one has um you know seriously injured themselves oh okay well that makes sense now i can i can make sense of your emotional expressions but so maybe maybe that's kind of what what um, is being hinted at here in the dialogue. Um, those who embody love, they they come across as irrational until you realize that they're motivated by love. Okay, so getting back to this question of uh, who embodies uh, this question of he who embodies love will perform certain actions essentially. So to become uh, so so this is what they talk about it at this point in the dialogue. So um, the person who embodies love will want to become famous and to lay up glory um, um, and become immortal forever and to uh, brave any danger for the sake of this uh, much more than they would for their children. Okay, interesting. And, and he, uh, someone who emb- embodies uh, love will also be prepared to spend money suffer through all sorts of ordeals and even die for the sake of glory. Okay. Okay. So it seems like love is an ideal you pursue that you're willing to risk your life over. It seems to, to, you know, go down in a blaze of glory and to be immortalized forever, you know, you know, through, through monuments that people might build or 
just through the history books, your name will be a part of history. And that's, you meet, you leave a memory behind for your posterity. And then and they kind of go in, into talking about these different archetypes when body love. So Alcestes is one, Alcestes dying for Adam, Adamatius, Ad, or sorry, Admetis. Um, Achilles dying for Patroclus. Um, Achilles doesn't actually die trying to defend Patroclus, but he, you know, he would, um, he would, he would die for his sake. Um, and then Audrus dying to preserve the throne of his sons. So all the, all these figures here, all these archetypes, they're motivated to pre uh, preserve their memory through their virtuous deeds and thus attain a semblance of immortality. So I thought of some, maybe some modern examples, um, Christ, for example, um, you know, he dies for our sins and he's immortalized. Um, many, we have many religious icons that bear the symbolism of Christ and paintings and um, many people have even encountered his divine presence that he is real, um, even if he's just an archetype. Um, doesn't mean he's any less real, I suppose, if he is an archetype. Um, today, Shakespeare, Milton, I mean, these writers, you know, basically have a, attained a semblance of immortality. Um, is passed on in their writings and you know and it seems with like the advent of our uh, electronic reality with everything being now uploadable onto the computer and um, onto the internet you know it seems like you can kind of achieve some kind of digital immortality too right <laughs> yeah that's a, that's actually an interesting topic you bring up uh you know, especially like the way that people use social media or, you know, just people's desire to like make some sort of viral sensation or be a part of it. Like it, it all seems to be kind of intertwined with this idea of like wanting to immortalize yourself in some sense, you know? Yeah, it does seem to be all tied up with that. I almost can't help but, you know, think right now, this whole philosophy salon we're doing online, um, these, these Zoom recordings that we're going to publish as part of our philosophy salon, in some ways, it's, I feel like it's kind of a way of us achieving digital immortality in some sense. You know, maybe we're partly motivated to be seen and heard and get our ideas across to people, but we're also motivated too by this more metaphysical motivation of wanting to preserve ourselves, you know, indefinitely through, you know, um, recording these conversations onto uh, the medium of video and then uploading it onto the internet for all people to see. Um, and I can look back at this in 50 years from now when I was uh, young and be like, oh yeah, yeah, this, you know, I, I'm, my physical body might be, you know, um, waning and I might be, you know, about to venture into the undiscovered land, but uh, my, my digital self will still be alive um, or alive in people's memories. And I don't know if that's equivalent to physical immortality. You know, do I, do I, is my um, recording of me, is that, is that me in any way? Or is it just, uh, you know, a bunch pixels, of pixels, bro. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of pixels on a screen and it's a replica it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a counterfeit it's not it's not really me it's a representation of me albeit a pretty realistic one in any case uh, that's, i think that's a fruitful digression that's something worth worth talking about all in, it, in and of itself yeah or legacy through the electronic media there's a there's a show that's out. I think it's on Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime, and it's called Upload. Mm -hmm. And the whole premise is basically this: that uh, you know, before you die, you can upload your self to 
basically like an afterlife, like a digital afterlife where you like live forever kind of thing. And it's like another version of real life, you know, with all, you know, a bunch of just weird nonsense and, you know, you get like advertisements and, you know, anyways, it's, it's just getting at this idea of, you know, trying to live on forever and like uploading our, ourselves, you know, to the cloud. <laughs> right. Like I could, I could see that being a, a dystopian state of the future at some point. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, people talk a lot about that, you know, um, in, in recent years, I don't know if it's entirely science fiction, I mean, it seems like the analogy in some sense makes sense. I mean, it seems like, you know, in some way, if this body I'm inhabiting is just a, just, it's just the hardware, and my consciousness is the software, then who's to say that, that that software couldn't get installed into another hardware system somehow? Um, well, Graham, we know you don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> well... Well, I think I think I think the computational metaphor is just the latest latest in our ways of conceptualizing, uh-huh. um, you know, this thing which we might call mind and this thing which we call body and their relationship to each other and whether mind some in some some sense transcends body, you know, mm-hmm. is maybe is maybe uh, is maybe more fundamental than body. Um, it's a whole conversation on, onto itself, but. But I think it's it's a it's good to to think about legacy in those terms, anyways. Yeah. Um, but getting back to the symposium here, um, they they get chatty about uh, Diodemus and Socrates get chatty about this question of um, people who are pregnant in body versus people who are pregnant in soul. So these are two. I take it these are two types of people who embody the pursuit of love. Um, as far as love involves reproduction, um, there's the reproductive act, um, and and there's those who are pregnant in body versus those who are pregnant in soul. Okay, well let's let's delve into this here. So people who are pregnant in body, they are those who are attracted to women and pursue love by begetting offspring. Okay. They achieve immortality through their posterity and through enduring remembrance and happiness. To achieve such immortality is to leave a genetic legacy, it seems. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. And then people pregnant in soul, okay, so these contrast people who are pregnant in body. So those who are pregnant in soul are attracted not only uh, to the body, but more importantly to the soul. Those who are pregnant in soul are attracted to bodies that are beautiful rather than ugly, as well as a soul that is noble, beautiful, and well-formed. When a person pregnant in soul and body comes into contact with someone who is beautiful, um, okay, I don't know where I was going with that. When a person body comes into contact with someone who is beautiful. Maybe I can pick up that thread later on. Those then, then they go on, those who are pregnant in their souls bring to birth what is fitting for the soul, namely wisdom and the rest of virtue. And examples of these individuals, individuals include poets and craftsmen who are high in trait openness or creativity, and they beget wisdom and virtue through their creative acts. Now, the greatest and highest aspect of wisdom to give birth to is to create order out of chaos through the through exercising the virtues of moderation and justice. And to think about this a little more concretely, just think of creating order within cities and households. Okay, so I always want to pause it there because that was fairly dense, what we just went over there. Think of all that. Yeah. 
just looking at the, the first first part of that there um you know those who are pregnant in the soul are attracted to not only the body but more importantly to the soul i mean i think that's uh you know i i think that's like we think about like sort of like love between two people you know it's it's like saying i'm sorry pardon me <clears throat> It's like saying, you know, if you have like a partner, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing to be just like attracted to them physically, mm -hmm. but you know, it's like saying, you know, you're going to love the person that they are, like their personality, their soul, you know what I mean? So if you yourself are pregnant in the soul, you know, you're not just attracted to the physical appearance, but also to something deeper down you know and i'm not just talking about people but like yeah you know it can be like a painting like oh wow that's a really nice painting uh that that's one surface level like the techniques they use were really good but appreciating something deeper down within the art or within the person um i, I think that's kind of what that's getting at yeah no, I think that's a good way of explaining it. Yeah, it's like like listening to music, for example, like a mu music or, or an artist you really like. And I know it's like a lot of music that I listen to over the years, especially the stuff that I keep coming back to. Um, say if it's some really good jazz or some good classic rock or something, like songs that kind of have, you know, for me kind of form the soundtracks of my life in some ways. And I, I kind of go back and listen to them year, year after year. And, and often, you know, I feel like I'm not listening to the same song. It's like a whole new song I'm listening to because I'm older, I have more experiences. I kind of interpret this, the song and the lyrics and everything all differently. And maybe in some sense, more in a more sophisticated way, like I kind of see it as a more of a complex, you know, aesthetic composition. And I can really uh, appreciate the artistic merit of the, uh, the artist who created it. And, almost feel like I'm experiencing what they experienced when they were composing it. You know, it's like as if they've evoked the same in me with their, with their music. Um, and what they're evoking in me seems to be something that's in some sense beauty. Maybe it's like something that seems transcendental, something that is beyond the physical, um, something that's in some sense ineffable. Uh, yeah, I think music is is special in that way too. Um, that's that could be a whole other conversation. Of <laughs> was just yeah. uh, you know looking at uh, revisiting philosophy and music and how that pertains to life, the nature of reality. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely a whole conversation onto itself, but it's definitely one that I find it to be fascinating. I know, I think Pythagoras talked a bit about the, uh, the harmonics of the universe and, and the um, kind of the, um, the harmonies of the spheres and how in some sense, you know, the mathematical order of the universe is in some sense has a, a musicality to it maybe. Um, And the, the Vedic, the Vedic sages talk about how everything is kind of vibration, vibration is sound, and what is music, music made out of sound? Uh, music made out of sound and vibration. You know, the sacred syllable Om. You know, apparently it's like that's the basic vibration of everything. Yeah, and uh, I always gravitate towards this this idea too that uh, you know our lives, you know, as human beings. Uh, this is sort of very counterintuitive to the Greek way of ancient Greek way of thinking, but uh, our lives, they don't have some sort of telos or there's no sort of end point in our life that we're looking to get to, you know, uh, if that were the case, the person who got to the end, the quickest, you know, would be, <laughs> right. would be the best, you know, and, and that's not the case with music either. 
right? Like, you know, the, the point of a, a, a composition isn't the last note, right? So it's, it's the whole piece uh, playing together in the right way with the right spirit. Um, so yeah, I just think music really occupies like a special, special place uh, in sort of the relationship to the human soul. And um, I think it kind of provides an interesting window into like our emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with most of what you said there. Definitely like to return to that topic in a more in-depth conversation down the road. Might, that might bear relevance though to what we're currently talking about. Um, maybe we can just bookmark that and see if, see if we can maybe return to that thread at some point in the conversation. So basically the poets and the craftsmen, um, their high trade openness or cre like creativity, for example, I'm kind of thinking of this in sort of like big five personality trait terms. And they, they beget wisdom and virtue through their creative acts. And the greatest and highest aspect of wisdom is to give birth to. So, okay, the, so this is the thing I wanted to return to because I think this is pretty key. Uh, is, is to give birth to, it's basically to create order out, create order out of chaos. Um, or, and so like, you know, we do this through cleaning up our room or, you know, um, or government um, who's able to establish a harmonious social order. Um, it's the, you know, it's, it's kind of taking the, what would you say, the wild jungle and, and turning it into a, um, you know, um, like, you know, a field of agriculture and farms and um, homes and, um, like, it seems like this is what humans in some sense do is they import, um, post order on things you know, where there is chaos um, before that. So that's the highest expression of wisdom. I mean, I just think of it as like, wisdom is making sense out of the world, right? We have a world that's kind of unpredictable, chaotic, um, especially in, you know, sort of the Hobbesian state of nature sort of sense, you know, the further you get, get to that, the more, you know, chaotic and unpredictable life, life gets. So, um, we're just trying to make sense of the world and trying to, to control it and, uh, you know, sort of bend it to our, to our needs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the quantum physicist, you know, being able to describe reality at the most micro level, um, you know, micro interactions and with a high degree of precision and accuracy, knowing cause and effect, you know, um, knowing how to reliably produce certain effects if we know what the, the antecedent cause is, you know, I guess a lot of that's what, that's what a lot of, um, behavioral psychology looks into, you know, looking to control behavior through uh, operant conditioning and responding conditioning. And that's one way we impose order on reality, I guess, insofar as that's an accurate account of how we can shape behavior. But that's what our goal is. I mean, I kind of have respect and admiration for behaviorism, but I think it is limited in some sense just seeks to understand everything in terms of behavior for one thing. I don't think everything in, in nature is behavioral necessarily. Um, in, I mean, that, that's, it has a limited domain. Like, I mean, the behaviorist is not denying that we have like a, a brain with all this neural chemistry and it's affecting us in all these different ways, but it's, you know, it's a theory about how to control and manipulate behavior and shape behavior. Um, to extinguish certain unhelpful behaviors, counter conditioning, 
there's a there's a charm to it too i find you know like comparing it to like freudian psychoanalysis which is like in my opinion is like kind of just like arrogant <laughs> in a, in a yeah. sense you know uh whereas like behaviorism you know might kind of seem like cold and you know d- doesn't really have or capture the this the life the psychological life of human beings but it keeps things simple you know what i mean whereas previously it was like oh all this dream analysis and like yeah. all this like really weird uh you know connections of the conscious and uh, right. you know <laughs> all this stuff so yeah i i find there's a nice charm and in, in behaviorism in that sense it just kind of keeps things simple <laughs> yeah well i think ultimately behaviorism in some senses is kind of like good old-fashioned empiricism you know it's um Skinner and Pavlov and Watson, you know, the, the great grandfathers of behaviorism, you know, kind of have their roots and their origins in the British empiricists, you know, of uh, Locke and Barclay and Hume. And primarily in the sense that I think, especially in the case of Hume, you know, in terms of how everything, um, like all our, all our thought processes and all, all our actions and everything are all based on association. So, yeah. You know, it's, it's the association between, I guess, certain stimuluses and response patterns, you know, or certain, even just certain associations within the brain, like our brain's this complex neural network. So, you know, if one node is activated and all these other nodes are activated and, um, yeah, in any case, we got, we, I, I guess we got on this digression partly because we were trying to make sense of what it means to, um, create order in our lives, you know, so one way we try to do that, we, we try to, you know, regulate our behavior, you know, we go see psychotherapists or behavioral therapists or some, some people who can help us um, develop the desired behaviors, develop or achieve the emotional state we want to achieve. Maybe we're depressed, we want to be happy, or at least neutral. So we go see a cognitive behavioral therapist or we go see a humanistic therapist who shows us unconditional positive regard and you know, we, we feel accepted and prized and we feel the therapist congruence because the therapist, you know, for the personality change to occur, the therapist has to be congruent and they have to, the therapist themselves has to um, kind of be aligned within himself and, um, and he has to trust in himself and, and to trust the, his clients to, uh, trust trust that his client has the, um, the you know the wisdom, um, the the or, on, like on on the organism level to um, overcome their problems and challenges. Right, that's what the the non-directive approach is trying to do. I guess to kind of encourage that innate self-actualizing tendency we all have that is that's kind of built into the wisdom of the organism. So the idea is that like if we trusted ourselves enough, and if we do not distort reality. If we represented everything truthfully to ourselves, then we'd have um, we'd have free access to all the sense data that, that was coming at us at any given time. So we'd know how to use it. But but when, when we distort things, you know, when we kind of um, have delusional beliefs about ourselves, for example, then that can distort the way we perceive reality. And then on the basis of that basis of that distortion, we interfere with the organismic wisdom of our body, which kind of gives us that information just through, you know, the, that sensory experience of that, those visceral feelings, everything. Um, in any case, that's, that's a bit of a, a digression, but that just trying to make sense of how we create order of chaos. Um, so to continue, um, when such a person uh, is attracted to a man, and the person we're talking about is someone who's pregnant in soul, when, when a person who's pregnant uh, in soul is attracted to a man, because, you know, the Greeks were into other guys, of course. Um, and this is in Plato's case, I guess. In our case, it would be also be attracted to women, too. Um, who possesses a beautiful body and soul, he instantly grasps hold of ideas and arguments about virtue. 
gives you the concept of a what virtuous man what a virtuous man is and the customary activities of he who engages in it by being open to the transmission of these teachings or ideas from a beautiful man or a woman okay so someone who is um, pregnant in soul is attracted to a man or a woman who's uh, beautiful not only in body but also in soul and it's in that interaction where um, we kind of perceive um, or, or we, we um, kind of get these ideas of uh, what it is to be a virtuous person. So when we come into contact with others, they kind of, they, they kind of elicit this knowledge within us, this knowledge of what it is to be a virtuous person. And then, um, and also what activities to engage in. So it's like our social nature in some sense. We come into contact with a beautiful man or a woman, beautiful in body and mind, and they uh, activate within us this knowledge of what it is to be a virtuous person, uh, someone who performs virtuous actions. So it almost seems as if, just to continue there, I'll, I'll return to that, that idea. So by being open to this transmission, uh, so being kind of being, being open in this relationships allows, allows these ideas to be transmitted to us by the beautiful man or the woman. Okay, so this is, this is fairly dense. Um, I guess I kind, of, I kind of articulate it a little more precisely in the next bullet point here. Um, when the individual makes contact with someone who's beautiful, the individual conceives and gives birth to the beautiful, which is latent within, within him all along. So it's as if there's that, that seed within us that's always there, but, but it's requiring that social interaction to be activated. Yeah, yeah, I see this uh, in kids, you know, uh, you'll get behavior that's more or less virtuous depending on who they're hanging out with, what crowd they're with. Right. You know, it's like, you know, as soon as they get with, you know, one group of people, I'm like, oh, got to watch out, you know, <laughs> yeah. but then sometimes they're with other kids and it brings out the best in them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a good way of putting it. I think that's something that it seems to be that resonates with our experience. I, I you know, I myself I can attest to that as well. I've, I've been around in my life, I've been around what you consider, you know, to be what Maslow would describe as like a self actualizing person, you know, what, what he would call like an ideal specimen of a human being. And just being around them, you know, regardless of what they say, just being around their presence makes you into a better person i feel like and um what was his name um was it bandura he was, uh -huh. he was the uh the, the cognitive behaviorist guy but he talked about in his theory of self-efficacy you know one of the ways we develop self-efficacy is through um social modeling yeah. and behavioral modeling and that's kind of one of the core conditions for achieving self-efficacy you know being an effective human being and i think i get i think this just gets back to our social nature and our, our tendency to um for us to engage in mimicry you know i think a lot of our learning just comes about just through sheer sheer mimicry like like even on a motor level you know we see someone reach out to grasp something when we're, when we're little kids and when we reach out to grasp it in the same way and, um, And we even just see that reflected like on a neurological level. You know, we have all these mirror neurons in our brain that are mimicking everything going on. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I know just when I watch somebody do something, it could be like, might be playing some game, whether it's darts or, uh, you know, I might go bowling, you know, so, something that I don't do very often, like play pool it really helps to watch the other people. Right. And, and just like pay attention to their posture and, you know, just the different techniques. Cause on my own, I, I'm utterly lost with those, those games. So it, it always helps actually watching somebody and also maybe like digging into 
sort of the mindset they have, like where are they focusing their attention while they're playing? So not just what are they doing with their bodies, but like what are they doing with their attention and and their mind? Yeah. Yeah, what's going on internally for them? Like what like what's their current state of being? Like do they, do they feel are they calm or re- relaxed? Are they kind of like more keyed up and on edge? Like um what's sort yeah. of what's what's the optimal what's the optimal um state of mind to be in when you're doing a certain activity yeah I, I especially notice with darts like you know where is your attention really matters like when you're trying to make a particular shot um you know it, it almost like it if you have your attention in the right spot your body kind of just follows through like your body just kind of knows what to do and it's about just being in the right mental state and you hear this all the time you know uh in different sports like oh it's mostly mental yeah you know (laughs) being in the zone yeah being in the zone yeah (laughs) yeah I, i mean i've been there before it's hard to describe but but i guess being being with someone who is uh you know, a master of their craft, whether it's a professional athlete or a professional writer or artist, you know, if you get a chance to be with that person um, and see how they um, work with their craft, you know, you can, you can really internalize a lot of that and you can manifest those, those same behaviors in, in you know, in, in your own self, almost by a process of osmosis, it would seem. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I watch uh, Joe Rogan's podcast and uh, not religiously, but, you know, watch little clips here and there. But uh, one thing that I, I noticed is uh, Joe's friends, they all talk about him as being that person in their life, you know, like that pushes him to be a better person, you know, or a better comedian or whatever, right? So I, I kind of think of him as sort of like the archetype friend, you know, that right. people would like love to have yeah. in their life. Like, you know, it's not just that he's a great comedian, but he's a good friend, he's a good person. You know what I mean? Yeah. At least to those people in their lives. And it's something that they say that hanging out with them makes them a better person, yeah. makes them a better friend. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a sign of um, someone who's a good friend. Someone who, you know, someone's a good friend when they they can help nurture your own growth as a human being, I guess, in some sense. Um, and, and maybe not even overtly, but just just by their example, just by... You know, we got, I guess we kind of got into talking about this a little bit when we were talking about the meaning of Christmas. And, uh, you know, um, that one character in um, Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Fezziwig, you know, Fezziwig would be at the party, you know, and it was not by anything he said, but just by his mere looks and his gestures and his, his jovial spirit. He could kind of get everybody at the party into a good mood and, you know, into, into a, a state of mirth. And, you um, you know, we, we all know that that person who can just show up at the party and the party's kind of dull and flat and this person shows up and they kind of just pull laughter out of thin air and they set everyone on uh, on fire. And um, that's the kind of person, I suppose, who can bring out good qualities within us. Um, and... And so that's what Plato's talking about at this point. He's talking about uh, those who are pregnant in soul, you know, by associating with a beautiful man or woman, those that beautiful man or woman can bring out these um, good qualities within us, these virtuous qualities. So to continue, um, the children or offspring of uh, he who is pregnant in soul are not mortal humans, but uh, immortal works of art. At least that's the way I've I've interpreted Plato. Um, So here we may think of the epic poems of Hesiod and Homer and other good poets 
who are in, envied and admired for the, for the compositions they have uh, left behind for posterity. By creating immortal works, the poets themselves become immortal. What is true of the great poets is also true of the great politicians. Lycurgus gave birth to the oligarchic laws and stern customs of Sparta, and Solon gave birth to the laws of Athens. Each of these creations brought salvation to their states, and they thus became immortalized along with their creators. So, so in contrast to the person who's pregnant in body, who's immortalized through their genetic legacy, the person who's pregnant in soul, um, immortalized through their cultural legacy, I suppose, maybe? Yeah. Cult cultural artifacts they leave behind, like uh, Homer's Homer's um, poems, or or the laws of Lycurgus, or Solon, in some sense. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, you get you get your uh, your typical, you know, try to immortalize yourself through your offspring, but. And there's also just your creative endeavors, whether that's, you know, some work of art, some contribution to society, uh, whether, you know, could just be on a local level or it could be on a more of a grand scale, like, like they're talking about here with the laws of Athens. Um, Yeah, yeah, they, they, the laws of Athens. I mean, Solon, I guess the Greek city state in Solon's, uh, I guess he, what we, what we call him, the leader of Greece, the president of Greece, the prime minister of Greece. I don't know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what they called their political authorities back then. Um, in any case, he, he spearheaded the first really legal system within, you know, a Western civilized state in some sense, like in some sense that was comparable to our modern laws, you know, that's kind of where the, the beginnings of that came from. And so, yeah, I mean, we, we, um, we all, we play, we pay homage, um, homage to our past poets, you know, the ancient poets. Um, we pay homage to um, our artists, our great artists, our architects. You know, the um, were built in the pyramids of uh, Egypt, you know, they've kind of been immortalized in that sense. And so it seems like there's some sort of immortality achieved through whatever creations you produce, you know. Um, a scientist, you know, Newton's laws, I guess they're kind of immortal in a way. Um, so that's, a, that's another way, I guess, through which you can preserve your legacy not only biologically, but um, intellectually, I suppose, as well, um, artistically. So in any, any case, that's, that's the distinction between those who are pregnant in body, those who are pregnant in soul. So I guess in the remaining time that remains here, maybe we can get through the rights of love. And I, I think that will bring us pretty close to the end of the symposium, whatever we don't cover Tonight, we can maybe just pick up with in our next exploration, maybe just offer some summary of remarks at that point. But just to, to wrap up here with the final topic of the symposium that we'll talk about is uh, the rights of love. And basically, the rights of love are these rights that Diodema describes to Socrates, which are, you know, these rites of passage that someone must take to... Um, know know the beautiful basically that's the end goal how do we know the beautiful and what is the beautiful and why do we want to know it so i'll just kind of outline the discussion here so the lover of wisdom uh, if he is to come to know the beautiful must proceed according to certain rights of love that is he must proceed according to certain stages of loving to know the beautiful in the first place he must love beautiful bodies which in turn will give rise to beautiful ideas, presumably of those bodies. Then he should then realize that the beauty of any particular body resembles the beauty of any other 
particular body. And from there, he will realize that the love of a particular body is the same as the love for other particular bodies, and that to love one beautiful body to the exclusion of others is narrow-minded and is to be avoided. Okay. So here, in this first rite of love, we have someone beginning initially with what, you know, loving physical things, uh, physical bodies, um, and then from there, proceeding to love the ideas of those physical things. And then from there, um, the love of one particular body kind of generalizes to other particular bodies. Okay. And, and so we're not so exclusive with the bodies that we, we love. We're a little more you know, indiscriminate. It's as if you know, we're okay loving many different bodies in that sense. Yeah, the, it's kind of similar to what I was talking about <clears throat> previously with, uh, like, you know, at first you, you see, you, uh, you hear a song or uh, you see a piece of art and you're sort of just captured by the surface appearance of it. Yeah. And then you kind of get to appreciate sort of like the deeper form of the thing. And that's how you end up learning how to appreciate, you know, other beautiful artworks, you know, maybe perhaps in the same genre, you know, say you weren't a fan of uh, country music or something. Right. And then you, you hear one country music song that you're like, oh, hey, I actually kind of like this. And then you start to appreciate sort of the, the form of country music a bit more. And then you're able to kind of expand and appreciating other country songs. Right. Not that I yeah. like country, I, I don't, but. <laughs> no, no. Well. I got nothing against country. I mean, I'll admit I probably like the odd country tune myself, although it's not really my go-to lineup of uh, music right now. But maybe I'll dabble around it in one of these days and see if I can experience the form of the beautiful in country music. Um, but I, I can see the point you're making. Um, you know, it's a, to take maybe a, a an own personal example. Um, it's, it's like being able to appreciate different writers, you know, different authors. Like I can appreciate Goethe um, for his neoclassical style, you know, which kind of in many ways kind of resembles the ancient Greeks, you know, the old ancient Greek satyr plays, but also there's a bit of biblical reference and allusion thrown in there. There's a bit of Shakespeare. And I can really appreciate Goethe for being the complex poet that he is and the ingenious poet that he is and I appreciate the um, aesthetic experience he arouses in me when I read his poetry whereas I'll read a, a more modern writer like James Joyce and he's just like stream of consciousness you know all over the place chaotic you know I can't anticipate what he's going to write next um, sometimes it's coherent sometimes it's like almost unintelligible but I know Beneath that unintelligibility, there's this order to it. And uh, I can appreciate both writers in that way. And the same, in that way, what, what is it? What is that common thread that makes me appreciate both of them? Maybe it's the form of the beautiful. Um, so anyways, that's stage one. Stage two, uh, the lover will come to realize that the beauty of people, people's souls is greater than the beauty of their bodies. So that was just kind of what you were intimating there, Ryan. So for example, if someone is beautiful in soul, but not so beautiful in body, the lover must be content to love that person. And in so doing, he will give birth to ideas that may better, that may better his, his beloved. Okay. Um, so. I just, I just thought of the, the typical girlfriend question. Would you still love me if I'm fat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well i guess according to plato you would if you were going to be a lover of the beautiful um and um so basically someone beautiful in soul uh will love someone who's who's beautiful regardless of whether they have a beautiful body they'll they'll be more attracted to their beautiful soul and and so, 
So that's when you, when you love your beloved like that, that within your beloved will give birth to certain ideas within them, I guess. And as a consequence of that, the lover will be forced to gaze at the beauty, um, all those uh, products of the beautiful soul. So the, you know, the beauty of the laws and customs is kind of what Plato has in uh, mind. Um, so, you know, the, the love for beautiful things, physical things, you know, is replaced by the love for, for the laws and customs. So things that were somewhat more abstract in nature, maybe. Mm -hmm. And, and then at the same time, he will come to devalue the beauty of bodies. And at this stage, his perception of beauty changes. So he, um, he no longer perceives beauty in a single example, um, like a particular boy or a woman. But he perceives the form of the beautiful, what Plato describes as the great sea of beauty. And perceiving the form of the beautiful ignites um, the lover of beauty's uh, creativity. And his, his pregnant soul then gives birth to many beautiful ideas and theories, and all of which is inspired by the love of wisdom. And after all of this, the man comes, comes to the um, see the knowledge of such beauty so this is pretty dense but i remember when i was going going over this there was several things coming to mind and one thing i was thinking of is you know the nature of like this common thread between all those things that we call beautiful what is it that makes all these things beautiful one way i was thinking trying to think about it was in terms of like family resemblances so in some sense, they're, um, you know, beautiful things all have this, this thing, uh, like this family resemblance between them. You know, some, some common particular quality, I guess, that, that exists in all of them, that they all have. Um, and, or, or another way of thinking about it is maybe like, um, perhaps, Beauty is universal, so it's a universal thing in all, all forms as well. So there are kind of two ways of thinking of it that came to mind. And then also what came to mind when I was reading this was, you know, especially at the end here, um, where he's talking about um, the person, uh, the, the person who comes to see the, uh, the knowledge of such beauty as a result of um, perceiving the form of beautiful things. And basically that gives birth to beautiful ideas and theories. And that kind of reminded me a little bit about the definition of philosophy we were talking about way back when we were talking about um, how philosophy was kind of viewed as kind of this activity of coming up with theories, you know, way back um, in that, that, uh, that story with uh, Pythagoras and the uh, that other political guy, the Panhellenic, Panhellenic Games. And talking about how like philosophy was this, was this like activity of like gazing upon something, you know, and to gaze upon something is to like to theorize. And so when I read this passage, I kind of think of the same thing, you know, philosophy is, is this activity of gazing upon the beautiful. And then that kind of elicits within us, you know, ideas and theories when we, when, when we, when we perceive it, you know, it's kind of like a, what would you say? Like maybe like a gestalt, you know, we're kind of perceiving the, the whole, you know, um, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. And we're perceiving that and that kind of that perception gives rise within us, you know, these different ideas, these different theories of the way reality works. So again, that's getting back to, to that, like organizing chaos, you know, we, with our minds, you know, we use theories to organize all of that, you know, to make some kind of ordered, coherent, sense out of all this chaos around us yeah i i think that's a really good way of putting it um yeah it, it definitely ties in with what we were just what we were just talking about i mean you know you look at something and you appreciate it but you're talking about like there's sort of like this more abstract uh nature to you know a, some beautiful body um and we, I guess we could call it a gestalt, you know, in a, in a way. Um, but, you know, that is, 
like part of what philosophy is, is taking a look at something and trying to abstract away these like deeper concepts or more abstract ideas from the particular, you know, and learning to appreciate it for, you know, it's sort of deeper nature. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's, it's a, I guess Plato here is opening up a whole new way of thinking about things, thinking about, thinking about uh, things in particular, what, what it is to be a certain thing, what properties does it require, you know, what attributes. Um, it's, all, it's all pretty interesting. I think, I think my ideas have been clarified as to what the nature of love is. I mean, we still haven't gotten to the end of the symposium. I guess for our next conversation, we can maybe close, close off that thread before we get on to the next topic. But so far, I mean, it seems like this concept of love is getting somewhat more akin to what I think about when I think of love of wisdom, you know, love as being this kind of love for this transcendent form of the beautiful, you know, which evokes within us, you know, ideas and theories about making sense of the world. You know, that kind of seems to me like what a philosopher does in many ways. Um, on just like the merely, um, well, what would I, would you describe it like as just as a kind of a desire to know things like a, just a pleasure in knowing things, which is more, more hedonic, I guess. Um, but it definitely does seem to be a motivation for, for the philosopher um, to, to be motivated by this, this love of beauty. So that's my take on it at this stage. I don't know where you weigh in on all of this. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll wait till we're done the symposium, still sinking in. Like, I already am still surprised at how much my understanding evolves as we go through these things. You know, looking back at my idea of Eros prior to these uh, recordings. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really sort of fleshed a lot of this out for me. And, um, you know, the, we have talked a little bit about the other forms of love and I'm, I'm excited to get into those uh, in the future, but uh, it's, it's interesting how, you know, even though we're talking about Eros um, and not Philia, how much re relevance, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, how much relevance it still has to philosophy. Um, so I, I think it's a really, it's been a really useful exercise to go through these different forms of love, even if they're maybe not etymologically, you know, related to, to the term philosophy. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree for all the reasons you've mentioned. I think it's a fruitful activity. I think it's one that helps for me to clarify my own understanding of my own concept of what love is and how that applies to philosophy. And I guess it's something I don't, I think that's probably like, an, it seems like it's a never ending process, that continual, you know, revision of what your concepts are, what their meanings are. You know, I think that's one of the beautiful things about, you know, there you go. There's that word again, beauty, beautiful things about philosophy is to continually articulate and rearticulate your concepts based on what your, your ongoing new ways of understanding things. But yeah, maybe like, Maybe just to briefly sum up what we've gone over, we've gone over um, Plato's ideas on the nature of love, um, what the, with, with the Greeks called eros, and Plato was recounting these ideas on the nature of love based on ideas that he learned from this wise old woman named Diotima. And basically we looked at how love is this, um, this mean between the extremes and it's something we, bec uh, we become pregnant for, you know, we can become pregnant in body and pregnant in mind, and we can give birth to physical uh, offspring or we can give birth to, you know, uh, works of art and creativity and science. And, and in doing these things, you know, this is how we pursue what we love. And ultimately in the end, we come to know 
uh, you, you know, we come to know the beautiful through, you know, this, this developmental trajectory, this personal evolution through all these different stages where we, you know, initially we're loving particular things and then we were loving many particular things, but then beyond that, we're loving, you know, the more abstract qualities of those things um, till we come to a knowledge of the good or sorry, a knowledge of the beautiful. Well, maybe those two things are the same, but we come to a knowledge of the beautiful and that within us, that, that triggers within us new ideas, new theories about reality. And in so doing, it kind of allows us to grasp reality, maybe in a more orderly kind of way. Um, ways that I hopefully I didn't botch uh, any of Plato's ideas there. I was just kind of winging it off the cuff, which in some sense is the whole point of these conversations we're having these in many ways, unscripted uh, exploratory conversations. Of course, I'm reading off my computer screen and reading off my, my uh, bullet points that I've taken on the symposium. But beyond that, the conversations are pretty raw. Neither of us have really put much preparation into this prior, you know, maybe just doing some preliminary research. So um, I think that's why it's also a fruitful activity because it is fairly spontaneous. And often we're kind of coming up with these discoveries, you know, um, in real time as, as, as people are, are viewing this podcast. So um, I think in some sense, it's a good way of modeling the activity of philosophy and how philosophy ought to be done in this kind of spontaneous conversational manner, kind of in this same manner that's recounted in the symposium uh, that we've just been discussing. So um, life imitating art. <laughs> so if you have no other uh, contributions, Ryan, we can maybe just leave it at that for now and sign off. Um, so stay tuned for our, our culminating discussion about the nature of Eros. And then from there, we'll probably begin a conversation about the uh, last form of love we'll be talking about, which is philia. So stay tuned for that. But um, for now, um, keep pondering.